While Europe was busily engaged in internal strife in the early 17th century, bands of seasoned pirates from North Africa used this opportunity to set sail under an Islamic flag on a long voyage into the North Atlantic. Sailing past the coasts of Western Europe, they headed for the islands of Ireland, the Faroese and Iceland. This is the extreme point reached in the Islamic expansion into Europe. Attacking and pillaging unsuspecting communities, the raiders made off with anything of value, as well as taking prisoners whom they sold into slavery and demanded high ransom for their release. Many of the captives were converted to Islam, but a fair number would in time regain their freedom and manage after great hardship to find their way back to their homelands. This is called the Maritime Jihad. This is a jihad and the jihad is a holy war for the faith. This is a highly political story, but it is also a personal one, of individuals whose names we know. We have no pictures of most of them, so we must borrow their faces from the rich gallery of 17th century portraits. We also relate in word and image the story of the many local tales relating these remarkable events. This is very much a living history in the regions where they happened. At the same time, this is the untold story of an Islamic Jihad deep into Europe, of Europeans captured and sold into slavery in Islamic Africa, at a time when Europeans were beginning to sell Africans as slaves to America. We listen to the accounts of local people and we dig deep in the archives so as to unravel an incredible but true story which has never fully been told before. On the 20th day of the month of June, 1627, there came sailing from the south to the tiny settlement known as Grindavik in Iceland, one Turkish warship. These are the opening words of a contemporary report. The raiders conceal their identity, pretending to be German whalers blown off course, and managed to take prisoner eight men who had rowed out to their vessel. They then captured the Danish merchant vessel in the harbor, all without a single shot being fired. The raiders then made their way to a neighboring farm, where they captured the entire family. Then a neighboring relative appeared and attempted to come to their aid. His name was Hjalmar, and he is the celebrated hero in this, our story. His praise is sung in a poem composed in Latin, detailing his exploits and read here on the battle's very site. Tergit in armatos set solus, ropore shalmar, inclitus atquanimo, lauta utrofe pari. Quam victor, quam po, cete potitus erat, tum prim ex sanguis per plurima vulnera bacto, hoste, set invicto, pectore prociterat. erat. The earth was stained with blood, and according to a local legend, where Christian and heathen blood blended, a rare type of thistle grew. Today this thistle is still to be found at a particular spot in the little fishing village of Grindavik on Iceland's southwest coast. With the booty from Grindavik, the raiders now headed for Bessestad, the seat of power in Iceland. Today it is the presidential residence, but in 1627 it was home to the Danish governor-general. At this time, Iceland was ruled by the Danish king. The country's official emblem was an unusual but yet appropriate combination of a fish and a royal crown. At Bessestad there was practically no defense, except for a light cannon or two, so the governor ordered nearby merchant ships to immediately join him. 
He then improvised a defense wall made of stockfish and covered with turf. He and his party rode out in saddles with brass inlays, pikes in their hands. As the sun reflected off their saddles, they had the appearance of a whole army of defenders. Cannon fire was exchanged, and during the clash, one of the raiding ships ran aground on a skerry. Some Icelanders now considered this to be an opportune moment to attack the raiders and free the captives. Til að gera áhlaup hér að svendu skipi þarf að manna opna árabáta og róa nokkur hundru metra gegn skotrið og ólíklegt að nokkur maður kæmist þangað lifandi. Svo jafnvel nú á dögum með allan þann útbúnað sem Víkingasveitir hafi verið að búa er ekki útlit fyrir að hægt hefði verið að gera neitt til að frelsa þess að fanga. And so the captives were not freed. But the situation did force the Turks to turn tail and disappear. For the moment, all was quiet in Iceland. However, no one knew whether this was merely a brief intermission before the next onslaught. On Thursday, July the 6th, people at a trading station on the eastern coast of Iceland were totally unsuspecting when early in the morning a mysterious ship dropped anchor in the bay. Upon coming ashore, its crew captured the local Danish traders who were still fast asleep. Next, they hunted down the local population. The raiders split up, with one group heading for a large nearby farm where they took 20 people prisoner. Another group went to the vicarage, capturing the minister, his wife and nine others. They herded these people all the way to the inner end of the fjord, where they left those who could go no further, bound hand and foot, and drove the others out along the northern shore. Several bands of raiders moved from one farm to another, taking people from each in turn. Householders, children, farmhands and beggars. And killing the old and infirm. The raiders were called Turks at the time and have been ever since. Throughout Europe in former centuries, the term Turks sometimes signified warriors of the Turkish Empire, but most often it implied any follower of Islam. Yeah, in the frühen Neuzeit had man natürlich keine Zwecks nationale Kategorien, wie sie dann im 19. Jahrhundert oder im 20. Jahrhundert auftauchen, äh, mit so einem Wort wie Türken verbunden sein. Türke war alles, was aus dem Orient äh, kam. As time passed, Icelanders would begin to view the story of the raid in a new and heroic light, giving it a wholly new interpretation. Sagan sagt, dass Türkir habe naut schmaler von Schneikami sem er hér nokkur kilometri vinnar bæ og færðu hann í bönd og þetta hefur verið í góðu veðri vafalaust því að hann síðan leggja þeir sig til fyldar og sopna en ekki hafa þeir nú gengið betur frá smalanum með það að hann honum tekst að losa böndin og hann hefur verið kjarkmaður góður því að hann er ekkert að leggja á flótta strax hann sér í hendi sér að nú þurfum hann að gera þyrkjum skráveifu og hann byrjar á því að míga í í púðri í byssunum þeirra síðan tekur hann á rás inn í snækvam snækvamsmenn fari í þverhamar og safna liði þá voru hetjur á hverjum bæ og heldur hér út í hrúta súlnagili og þá eru tyrkir að vakna af mýtteginslúrnum grípa þegar til byssana en þær yrka ekki og þá hófu þeir áhlaup á mennina, þeir þverramarsmenn og snakarsmenn og þeir 
börðu þá hérna niður gilið og hérna niður fyrir og niður í hérna niður í niður í sjó og einhverju munu hafa spýtt rauðu á á þeirri leið og síðan áfram sem leið liggur út að klöppinni sem að er gengur lengst hér út í sjóinn svona í miðjunni og þar lömdu þeir þá síðustu niður og dregtu þeir þar út að klöppinni og hún heitir síðan Kirkja klöpp Nevertheless, fear and suspicion of the Turk would linger on right up to the 20th century. Amma mín sagði okkur oft sögur svona af tilgjónum og var alltaf hrætt við, greinilega hrætt við þá eða hrætt um að þetta gerðist aftur. Og einhvern veginn höfum við tvö elstu systjinin drukkið þetta í okkur og hrætt það mikið hvernig við ætlum að forða okkur ef eitthvað gerðist, ef eitthvað í kæmur sem að þá ætlum við að hlaupa heima frá bænum Svo ætlum við um leiðu við verum horfin inn fyrir brúnina, hlaupa ofan eftir klettinum, ofan á fórsáni, stökka ofan í hér, fram af svona auðvitað það mann hefur hafa um stafli og stjóta okkur þar inn í hellir sem að, sem sagt, sömu megin og ofan. Þar skapa ekki nokkrum að hundið okkur, hvorki séu fjöru eftir okkur eða við erum bara, tískirnir hefur haldið við erum bara drekkt okkur í ánir, þetta er í ljótu og svona straumþungu gjeli. The children of the 20th century can manage to escape in their game. But in 1627, the children of the East Fjords with their parents were taken hostage on board pirates' vessels. Nor had their captors, multinational followers of Allah, had their fill. Rather, they now headed for still richer pickings, the Westman Islands off the south coast of Iceland. Small, isolated islands had always been a favorite target of pirates. The landscape of the Westman Islands harbors many memories. The dramatic and violent events experienced by the island's small community, those fateful summer days in 1627, remain a vivid memory. Each spring, local children make a study trip of the main island to learn the details of the raid and recreate them in pictures. Here, overlooking the traditional sea entrance into the harbour of the Westman Islands, the Danes built a small battlement, complete with cannon. Today, children scamper about while they learn of their forefathers' preparations and fears during the summer of 1627. News of the raids had already reached the island community. The cannon and the fort were put at the ready. People prepared to flee some of them to caves in the cliffs used to dry and store fish. No suspicious vessels were sighted on the horizon, and peace soon returned to the islands. But was it merely a calm before the storm? Later, people with second sight would claim to have seen portents of what was to come. Modern children can imagine what they looked like. On Monday, July the 16th, Three ships were sighted east of the islands, making but slow progress in the calm weather. Were they perhaps Danish, sent to defend them? The ships, however, were not Danish. Their crews avoided sailing within range of the cannons, but instead made land at an unexpected spot no one had ever attempted before. The children survey another side from the story. It was here the attackers poured onto the shore, on the evening of July the 16th, 1627. The raiders split up into three groups, charging forward with war cries and red banners flying. The largest group headed straight for the so-called Danish houses, the center of the settlement. Here, they held their prisoners. The local church was pillaged and desecrated. In the blood-soaked trail left by Allah's warriors in the Westman Islands, there is one story of mercy extended. In this residential district in the Westman Islands, there is a large rock which is said to be blessed. A pregnant woman fleeing from the raiders could go no further. Exhausted, she lay down in the shelter of the rock to give birth. When a raider came upon her, instead of harming her, he would place his cape over her. One of the two Lutheran ministers on the island was a composer of psalms, which are still sung in Icelandic churches today. He fled with his household to a cave, where he read them consolation from the Bible.
blood began seeping through the roof of the cave when the raiders slew an elderly member of the minister's household who had ventured outside. Armed men rushed into the cave led by an Icelander who, according to some reports, was a former servant of the minister. This Judas addressed the clergyman. What are you doing here? Shouldn't you be at prayer in your church? To which the minister replied, I was there this morning, now I am here, and this evening I will be in heaven by God's will and not yours. The traitor struck him three blows so that his skull split asunder. His wife then unwound the trappings of her headdress to bind his head, but the attackers forced the family away from the body and herded them in the direction of the Danish houses. The minister was deemed a martyr after these events. His gravestone is still preserved with the Latin inscription Ocasus, meaning slain. On Thursday, July the 19th, 1627, the soldiers hauled anchor and set sail, firing their cannons in celebration of a successful raid. The local church stood in flames, as did the Danish merchant houses, where the old and infirm were burned alive. In all, about 400 prisoners were taken captive, which accounted for almost 1% of the Icelandic population. Two years pass, and peace has returned to the North Atlantic. Then, in 1629, the raiders make the long voyage northwards yet again, this time in order to attack another island of the Danish monarchy, the Faroe Islands. Það <tjum> Það var sandanum hér um stæðan og hann hegi svo í lutla sonu við sem var sjæju ára gæma og hann sér ein af þessum hér að rabarna liggja að knæða og byggja og hann fór að flenna og hann hefur byggja helst því hann verið móða með smæður og þær vildi svo teka dróndjun men pápum var kvíkur prestur hann tók hann upp á hestun og svo að stæða við hann blei svo eldur inni gjögna dælun hér Og pápa sem var að hesti, hann var sjón nægg undan, hann fekk svo krókva dróndjun í mittlt var steinar. Men hann hegjaði reyðan kappa að herun og hann reypaði hann eða sér. Og helt svo fram. Men ein af turkun og finnir þetta hér klægi. Klægið og ísi og kemur fór að búja sem dróndurinn líkur krókva á úr. Og hann heldur sjóðan þetta pápa sóin. Og ró bara pápa sóin sem hann heldur í pápa sóin um að taka sér við mann út en turkjum. Og þar tóku svo dróndjum. Og það blev svo illvegjör, meðan þeir voru í unni að kvalpa. Og svo sér sann hún að tvei af skipunum fór í að land hér við til vinstri, sem okkur ráp undir hundajók. Og annar sann hún sér að annar af tvæmum fór hér. Trújundra manns skuld svo dodja. Og þær skuld að liggja grunur hér oman fyrir okkur, sem okkur kallar Jörasandum. Og það að ég var áður þegar þú sér fyrir þegar ég hann er fjörður þegar hann trúsur aðeins og hann og það svaðan hann tújilega þessar hedjanum það tykkvinnar sem okkur segja sem okkur rápa endan þegar 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 fyrir túrskagrafni Prestasonun hann var eina tæm og sem gekk burtur illa dojið það í skipinu fór í land og sögnum segir það að munnurinn og hann var skorin aftur og ærur og ærinu voru skorin eldrónsin Men pappi hans sa att han blev så örur i hattun och lade sväkor. Och han var så bara präster i kväll på ett år att träda. Och i 1630 tar man till att lägga fram sig som präst. The raiders booty included over 30 captives, women and children exclusively, 
as well as sheep and other valuables. Six men lay dead in their wake. Another two years pass, and once more the raiders take to the Atlantic, though not as far north this time. In mid-June 1631, they steer their ships in the direction of Ireland. On June the 19th, a small ketch crosses the path of the raiders off Cape Kinsale. Its skipper, a man called John Hackett, was ordered to show them the way to Kinsale. Hackett explained that the town was well defended and advised them to attack the nearby village of Baltimore instead. All full of love and peace and rest, his daily labours o'er, upon that causey creek there lay, the town of Baltimore. And so the raiders sailed to peaceful Baltimore, casting anchor just outside the town's natural harbour late one evening. After sending out a party of spies, they made everything ready. And the yellow valley breaks above the prayer and shriek and roar. Oh, blessed God, the Algerine is Lord of Baltimore. To commemorate the sack of Baltimore, the town's children reenacted the event one summer night. This included the fate of the fishing skipper Hackett, who directed the raiders to Baltimore. The raiders allowed him to go free as a reward. However, an English court would later sentence him to death. The image of the sack of Baltimore was very much influenced by a 19th century romantic poem written by one of the great leaders of Irish nationalism, Thomas Davis. He composed the poem in 1844 and um, he hadn't ever been here. but. Uh, at the time, I wouldn't say there were any Irish historians as such. Um, it is always an adage that the victors always write history, and the Irish weren't in that situation, not for another century. The approach was to try and restore the dignity and the, the vision of Ireland that Irish people would like to have of a nation. And so any time he um, came across a story, he would romanticize it and give us a noble setting. Midsummer morn in woodland eye the birds begin to sing. They're seen at now the milking maids deserted is the spring. They dash to sea and pass Cape Clear and saw five leagues before the pirate galleys vanishing that ravished Baltimore. Though recorded in 19th century verse and performed as a children's pageant in the 20th century, the sack of Baltimore is a little-known event in Irish history. Rodan of Yoga Hall and so, Nurahanik and Algerians and so, action and Fanak will share talk that our food and tea are capem. Thosh Karhanik na lochlanig agus na sasnig agus gaxais dina gaheren near vinche shalle ein cuid eile den tiar ag le dunasiad. Thank <laughs> But when you compare it to one and a half million people who died of hunger in the famine and maybe two million people having to immigrate, then, you know, it wasn't a major historical event in Irish history, I suppose. You know, going to school, you learn history in school, and I remember my own history in school, the history was always about the British and the Irish and the horrible things they did to us. What eventually happened to the wretched and forgotten captives from Ireland when brought to Africa? The Irish poet Thomas Davis gave us a portrait of one maiden from Baltimore who had, when in Ireland, a sweetheart in the nearby town of Bandon. She had become the property of one of the elite of Algiers, the day of the city. The maid that Bandon Gallat sought is chosen for the day. She's safe, he's dead. 
she stabbed him in the midst of his array. And when to die a death of fire that noble maid they bore, she only smiled, O Driscoll's child, she thought of Baltimore. The noble Irish maid depicted in the poem is a fictitious person. Of the fate of the captives from Ireland, we know very little. We are, however, on firmer ground as to the fate of the captured Icelanders. The most renowned among them being Gudridur Simonototur, immortalized in works of fiction and the visual arts. She has found a contemporary spokesman in an Icelandic author who has written extensively on her fate. Hún var ambátt hjá Ali Dey, um það höfum við skýrar heimildir og segir það í sínu bréfi, í því bréfi sem hún reitaði. Hryggist ég og særist daglega að vita hann í þvílíkri neyð og háska sem oss er upp á lagt vegna vorra synda. Hún er staðfyrst í sinni kristni trú allan tíman after many years in captivity, she would eventually return to Iceland, but was forced to leave her only son behind in Africa. Even though one letter from Gudridur in captivity exists, large gaps in her story have to be filled in by guessing. European artists portraying the lives of slaves in Algiers in a propaganda war against Islam, the arch enemy of Christianity, were also guessing to a large extent. Sometimes they depict the city as a hell on earth, a place where men devise the most ingenious and horrible forms of torture. But there was also another side to the slave cities of North Africa. Some slaves had kind masters, regained their freedom, and were as satisfied with their lot as anyone can be who is torn up from their roots. Anna Jasper's daughter, an attractive woman from the Westman Islands, married a Spanish Moor and converted to Islam, at least publicly. After that, she was dressed in furs and royal purple, according to her Icelandic contemporaries. She and her husband paid for her father to be set free. He managed to return to Iceland and praised his son-in-law for his generosity. Among the Icelandic hostages taken was Pastor Oliver Eilson, the local Lutheran clergyman from the Westman Islands. A well-educated man, he would record events in his travelogue, a unique documentary source where his keen eye catches every minute detail. The land yields two crops yearly, and all the fruits of the earth flourish there. The grass is never cut, and sheep and cattle remain outdoors all the year round, since there's no winter. These pagan people reap all the benefits in this life. The town is very narrow at the upper end, near the mountain and very long and wide at the sea. The marketplace is a square built up of bricks, and the ground is paved with stones, which I understand is washed every day, as are the main houses, sometimes as much as three times a day. This marketplace is next to where the local king has a seat. Now the people from the Westman Islands were brought to the marketplace and the king selected every eighth person. His first choice among the boys was my own poor son, eleven years old, whom I will never forget as long as I live. Then he said with great sadness, Father, they can do with my body as they will, but my soul is forever the Lord's. After the Icelanders had been sold into slavery, Pastor Eilson was summoned before the city's authorities. He was instructed to make haste with the news to his king, Christian IV of Denmark and Iceland, and request that the monarch pay a ransom for the release of his subjects. With much pleading, he was allowed to bid farewell to his wife and two young children, before meeting with the city's rulers who would grant him a letter of safe passage. 
He was then put on board a ship bound for Italy. After weathering stormy seas, they finally reached Livorno. Pastor Eelson, who had been a chain captive of both Turks and Moors, was no sooner a free man in this Christian city than he witnessed the very image of his own previous fate, shackled slaves. The irony, however, was that these were Moorish slaves taken prisoner by Christians. They were not of flesh and blood, but of bronze, newly placed on a pedestal when they caught the pastor's gaze. And there they are to this very day, strikingly real. No doubt they left a deep impression on Pastor Ailson. These lifelike figures were replicas of a Turk and his three sons who had wreaked great havoc on Christianity. In stature, they were like giants. The town's duke had conquered them in battle and had had their figures cast in memory of his victory. His image stands over them sword in hand. Scripture tells us that bad fortune will befall the ungodly. Traveling through a turbulent Europe ravaged by war and plunder, Pastor Ailson finally reached his destination, the capital of his kingdom. On the 28th, I came to Copenhagen, and as soon as I got there, I was received as an angel of God. Danish merchants who traded with Iceland wined and dined Pastor Eelsen for many weeks, and he would be guest of honor at numerous banquets hosted by Danish nobility and Icelanders. Nowhere is there better beer to drink and food to eat than in Copenhagen. Icelandic travelers still enjoy the city's hospitality, and Pastor Eelsen is still a source of interest to the city dwellers. This group of people has come together to discuss the publication of his fascinating travelogue and learn more as to what kind of person he really was. Uanset om man drager igennem Europa i under 30 års krigen, hvor der er pest og kolera og slagskamp alle steder han kommer, han har ingen penge på lommen, han kan kun islandsk, og alligevel så kæmper han sig igennem og når sit mål. En meget, meget imponerende skikkelse. Meget imponerende. On the 8th of April, I got the opportunity to see His Most Gracious Majesty, the noble-born King Christian of Denmark and Norway, the fourth of that name. This gracious monarch seems to be humble and gentle with his subjects. While the king expressed his willingness to pay the ransom, the ravages of war meant that Denmark had lost extensive territories, and the royal coffers were empty. My sorrow deepened again, because then all my hope was lost with force that I would get support there, and so buy my wife and children's freedom. Pastor Eelsen expected the Danish monarch to help him and his fellow captives. But was King Christian obliged to do so? Han havde bestemt pligter. Han havde jo underskrevet en håndfæstning, hvor han lovede at forsvare sit land og sit folk med yderste evne. Og der er ingen tvivl om, at det mente han bestemt også, han gjorde. At han så var lidt uheldigt indimellem, det, det, det er der jo ingen tvivl om. Og der er ingen tvivl om også, at Christian han følte et dybt ansvar over for sine folk. Og det var ikke bare dem i København, men det var sandelig også i Norge og på Island og på Færøerne, som han helt klart interesserede sig meget for, meget the king was unable to offer assistance for some time, but Pastor Eelsen did manage to get his wife freed. As to his children, he never saw them again. However, writing about his trials and tribulations would help ease the pain. Oh, that I might comfort and strengthen my people with my words. But whether I speak or not, the pain in my heart remains. Whatever may unfold, we are the Lord's.
Danish subjects, church and monarch, made a concerted effort to raise the ransom money needed to free the Icelandic captives, or at least those willing to accept this. The Faroese captives were not as lucky. When the same monarch requested them to donate ransom money, Faroese officials responded that they lacked the means to do so because of poor catches and hard times. Nothing more was heard of the captured Faroese. The captives from Baltimore had even less hope. The English Admiralty would pay no ransom, no redemption money. They had set in stone no redemption. So the hundred people from Baltimore were left to their own devices. As to those deserted by their home governments, what opportunities do they have in the Islamic countries of North Africa? The whole of the commerce of the Barbary Coast was based around skill. If you had skill, if you had intelligence, if you had um, drive, no matter where you came from, you could come from a small village in, in Croatia, a small village in, 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 um, in Ireland, or a small village in, in, in Iceland. But if you had the drive and the vision, you could make it in a society that was open to change, as long as you accepted Islam. That was the only condition. We are going to follow one of these skillful Christian Europeans who cast the dice and transformed his life and indeed the lives of hundreds of others by renouncing Christianity and embracing Islam. He is specifically chosen because he is the leader of the raids on Iceland, the Faroe Islands and Ireland, the leader of the Atlantic Jihad, one Murat Rees. A Dutch sea captain has researched Rees's maritime career. And yes, the jihad leader was of Dutch origin. His original name, Jan Janssen. Maar als je hier om je heen kijkt naar 17e eeuwse huizen, veel water, en als u achter me kijkt ook nog de zee, dan kunt u zich voorstellen dat uh, Jan Janssen in een omgeving zoals dit is grootgebracht en dat hij als uh, kleine jongen en misschien zelfs als jonge man in dit soort omgevingen uh, zijn eerste levensjaren sleet voor het in zeggen. Our hero Jan Janssen went to sea, where he is captured by Algerian pirates off Lanzarote in the Canaries. He has a wife and family in Holland, but in the city of Algiers his life is transformed. Jan Janssen converts to Islam and is given a new name, Murat Rees. He is taught the pirate's trade by the best in the profession and soon makes a name for himself. Then he disappears, only to reappear suddenly a few years later in Morocco, to be precise in the city of Saleh, from where there was growing pirate activity northwards into the Atlantic. Saleh was a bustling city with Berbers plying their wares, European emissaries and merchants negotiating the release of slaves and selling cannons. Jews serving as merchants or local government officials. And then there were Moors, driven from Spain and hungry for revenge. In the city of Saleh, Murat Rees rose to the position of King's Admiral, and in that capacity he conducted the raid on Iceland. Upon his return in August, while the captured Icelanders and Danes were being sold into slavery in the marketplace, he sat writing in his castle. He wrote officially to the Dutch government, apologizing for the capture of a Dutch vessel by one from Saleh. The letter of February the 16th from Your Excellencies, I received only yesterday since I have been at sea. You speak of the breaches in the alliance between our governments. The captain of our vessel is not to blame, his crew having mutinied. I am heartily sorry for this disobeying of my orders, and I will do all in my power to benefit my fatherland, to respect and honor it, so long as I draw breath. I do not know how events will develop here in Saleh, since the townspeople are in revolt against their king. As to what the future may hold, only God can say. Your entrusted friend, Morat Reis. But why did the raiders from North Africa venture forth on a voyage into the North Atlantic, a voyage taking months, when they could have continued their profitable raids along the coast of nearby Spain? Well, 
For one thing, Spain was no longer an easy prey. At considerable cost, Spain had now fortified its southern shores against attacks from North Africa. Pues tenemos aquí delante nuestra una de las cientos de torres vigía que a lo largo del siglo XVI y durante unos 70 años se hicieron construir para defender a los pueblos de la costa de constantes ataques que venían de la costa de África de los piratas moriscos. And then there were more fundamental reasons why the Muslim Corsairs would take to the Atlantic Ocean. But the Barbary Corsairs and other Muslim sea powers could only operate on a limited scale in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, in the Persian Gulf, in the Indian Ocean. The Atlantic was beyond them. Until the beginning of the 17th century, when the rulers of England and of Holland who had previously been at war with Spain, decided that the time had come to make peace. The Spaniards recognized the independence of the Netherlands and gave up hope of conquering England. And peace was established with the result that the buccaneers and privateers who had flourished in the time of Queen Elizabeth of England and the various rulers of the Netherlands suddenly found themselves out of a job. They were no longer heroes, they were pirates. And instead of being knighted, they were in danger of being hanged. <laughs> so many of these decided that their profession was more important to them than their religion. <laughs> their profession, they professed piracy. <laughs> so many of them went to North Africa, changed their religions, and instead of being Christian buccaneers, they became Muslim corsairs. <laughs> And uh, that gave the Barbary Corsairs what in historical terms one must call a brief episode of operating in the Atlantic. The brief episode of Atlantic jihads in the life of Murat Reis, the king's official pirate, was over. He had survived countless raids in different waters. He had been taken prisoner by Christian pirates from Malta and had his ransom paid. Now on in years, he served his Moroccan king in a comfortable position in the little town of Ouwalidia, today a holiday resort. We have come to pay him a visit in what remains of his castle. Yes, we are sure that this is the dwelling place of Murat Reis, Dutchman become Moroccan, Christian turn Turk, raider of the Atlantic, leader of jihads. And how do we know this? By a fortunate turn of fate. A ship's journal reveals the secret to us. The journal was kept by a professional painter during an official mission by Dutch emissaries to the Moroccan coast in 1641. Also on the mission was Murat Reese's daughter, Elizabeth, from his Dutch marriage. By yet another fortunate turn of fate, this journal is still well preserved, if you only know where to look for it, namely the National Library in Vienna. What is even rarer it still has the original drawings made by the keeper of the journal. When father and daughter meet, the writer is touched by the scene. He sailed towards us, resplendently sitting on a mat with silken pillows around him, surrounded by servants. He was shown to the ambassador's quarters, where his daughter was already waiting, and when they saw each other, they burst into tears. But what was to become of Murat Reis, the notorious pirate leader? The last we know of him in historical sources is that he is residing comfortably in his castle with his daughter. And as to information elsewhere? Well, let's try the internet, which reveals all the secrets of modern day. Type in his Dutch name, Jan Janssen, and Turk. American genealogists can tell us that a son from his Moroccan marriage emigrated from Saleh to America and established the family line known as Van Saleh. The cream of this line includes such renowned figures as Humphrey Bogart and Jacqueline Kennedy. Such future family fame, Murat Reis could hardly have imagined, residing in his castle in North Africa in 1641. But how does history go about evaluating such a complex person as Murat Reis? 
denk dat ik u wel kan vertellen dat het zijn van kaptein op een uh, kaperschip of op een piraat. Natuurlijk nog wat harder was dan uh, op een gewoon schip. De mannen die daarop voeren, die waren natuurlijk uh, niet van het uh, allerzachtste, zachtzinnigste soort. En waren graag bereid om een nieuwe kaptein te nemen als die niet deugde of als die ze niet van voldoende pecunia kon voorzien. You cannot have a career that long without being intelligent, without being bright, but without having a degree of humility and understanding of the human condition of what it takes to achieve it. Yes, I am a fascinating man um, and very impressive. While the secrets of pirate leader Murat Reis can be unveiled in the Library of Vienna, secrets of the victims of the Atlantic Jihad are kept here, in a bundle of documents at the National Archives in Copenhagen. They tell the story of a Danish envoy named Ambrosio Volgesum, who was in the midst of the bustling slave city of Algiers in 1645. He concluded agreements with slave owners and managed to ransom 23 persons, among them eight Icelanders who had waited 18 long years. Here are their names and the price of their ransom. Combined, the amount is the equivalent of several private apartments in modern terms. One of them is Barbara, the mother of three children. Everyone wanted to free her. Who could she be? Freed after 18 years of captivity, her children must have been born there and she herself only a child when captured. Still a Christian after all these years? And her children not converted to Islam as was usually the case? As to what happened to her and the group of captives, we only know that they managed to cross the Mediterranean and travel all the way to Copenhagen. After that, there is merely silence. But we do know quite a bit more as to the fate of Ambrosio Volgerson. So many ransom contracts had been concluded that there was not sufficient money to free all of them. Ambrosio had to borrow money. His loan collected interest, and until it was paid, he could not leave. He himself was held as security, together with several of his countrymen. Ambrosio Volgerson's trials and tribulations can be traced in letters written to his superior in Spain. He both despised and feared the Algerians, whom he generally referred to as dogs. He could not be ransomed himself because the king's coffers were empty after a new military defeat. Months passed and turned into years. His despair grew and there were few options open to him. Should he flee? take his own life or become a pirate himself? Could he have chosen a different course, lived a comfortable life in Aalborg with a family in a house similar to this? Finally, the Danish king's Mediterranean mission is officially ended, leaving Volgerson behind in captivity, suffering and uncertain as to his fate. The tragedy of Ambrosia Volgerson would continue. For his entire life, he could only dream of an angel who would free his chains and lead him along God's path. Envoy Volgerson abandoned in a debtor's prison, captured villagers from the Faroes and Ireland, forgotten by their countrymen, a dark-skinned moor chained to a pillar. Had the Savior not suffered for these and others so sorely tried? As the small congregation gather in a low-ceiling church at Cross on the south of Iceland, they are reminded of their ancestors who suffered so much in that fateful year of 1627. This altarpiece has been here for over 350 years. It was donated by Klaus Eolson, chronicler of the Turkish raid, and Niels Clemenson, merchant of the Westman Islands, who fared worst in the attacks. The little choir sings a psalm composed by the pastor who became a martyr in those never-to-be-forgotten raids on Iceland. The people have given us the 
þessa atburði með því að gera þá hluta af menningu okkar, sögu okkar, minningum, kvæðum. Og við sjáum hvernig fólkið í byggðarlögunum í kringum landið þar sem þessir hörmulegu atburði gerðust hafa gert söguna að sinni sögu. Og á þeim tímum sem við lifum, þegar við fréttum um hörmungar, árásir og morð á saklausu fólki, þá felst líka lærdómur í þessari sögu. Að það er ekki hemdin sem er lausnin, í henni er ekki skjól. Heldur er það siðmenningin, það sem að felst í vitund þjóðana, sem ein getur læknað þegar tímar líða, þau sár sem eru veitt. Ja, und ich skal breder 